Lord God, thank you for giving us this opportunity to, to study your word. Bless us and your Holy Spirit that we grow through this and grow in our appreciation and knowledge of you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so last time we uh, had some good discussion. We got to page eight. Is that right? Does that uh, sound about right? Okay. Um, any questions that you had about any of that or anything we, we've talked about? All right. Well, good. Well, then, then we'll roll in. So in... In chapter one, we talk about who God is and some of his attributes. In chapter two, uh, we're, we're looking at sin and grace and, uh, you know, what God has done for us. So we, we started with that discussion of the angels, you know, the first sin, uh, Satan tempted Adam and Eve to sin. Um, and then we had talked about the consequences of that a little bit, right? That, that uh, God said, all right, women will have pain in childbirth. You know, I don't know what it would have been otherwise, but... Um, yeah, now it's painful. The people will work and won't always be fun, right? By the sweat of their brow. Uh, Adam and Eve had to leave the garden. People had to die. Uh, Adam and Eve lost the image of God. Those were consequences of, of sin. And, and then the future consequences is that because Adam and Eve were sinful, their offspring were going to be sinful. Um, so you know, a man, man will have offspring in his own image, not in the image of God. You have that, that passage from Genesis 5. You know, when Adam and Eve were created, remember, you know, in the image of God and his likeness and his image, and you know, said that several times. And now Adam lived 130 years. He had a son in his own likeness, in his own image, and he named him Seth. Um, so it was, it was going to be, we're born in sin, right? Uh, uh, we talk about original sin or inherited sin. Um, the, the fact that when we're born, we come into the world having inherited that from our parents, and that's that's what we are like. So, Matthew, you want to read the Psalm 51 passage at the top of the page? Uh, page 9. Surely, I will take care of those who take it on to Okay. Um, that, that's who I was, who I am. And John 3, Jesus is talking, and he says, flesh gives birth to flesh, right? A sinful human gives birth to a sinful human, but the spirit gives birth to spirit, gives birth to faith. Um, and so because of that, we have no hope, right? Because God's holy, we're sinners, we, we deserve to be destroyed, but then God came with the promise. Um, uh, Romans 5, God demonstrates his own love for us in this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Um, Jeremy, you want to read the Genesis 3 passage? I knew you'd make me say the word enmity. There you go, enmity. You got it. You got it. Okay. <laughs> and I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. Okay, thank you. Sorry, this is uh, trying to send. It doesn't want to send that link. There we go. Got it. Okay. Um, so, Vicar, when I go, Terrell should be hopping on, and you might have to admit him. So when I when I had him hop up here. Um, so, yeah, God, God told Satan, I'm going to put hostility, enmity, between you and Eve, you know, and humanity, uh, between your offspring and hers. And then he promises that one offspring that's going to crush Satan's head, and Satan's going to strike his heel, right? So it'll be painful. Of course, he's talking about Jesus. God makes this promise of Jesus. So we talk about the, the gospel, the good news of what Jesus is doing. And, and when we talk about that, we, we talk, look at two things. The rest of the lesson covers the law and the gospel, right? The law shows us what we deserve, shows us our sin. The gospel shows us our Savior. Um, so let's read. I'll actually read it because uh, I'm going to break it up a little bit. So this is Romans 3, um, this long section is actually, so Paul writes this letter to believers in Rome. Um, this is the one letter he writes that, uh, to a group that he didn't start. Um, he knew some of these people, but it was people that he, you know, that had come, become believers and they moved to Rome and Paul hadn't been there yet. So he writes a letter to them, kind of just going over the whole thing. This is how salvation works. And, and he starts with his normal greeting, you know, I'm Paul, I'm writing to you people in Rome, and, and God's awesome. There's a quick little, uh, you know, song of praise at the beginning. 
And then he gets into the meat of this letter. And for the, the, all the rest of chapter one, all of chapter two, the first half of chapter three, he's doing one thing. He's preaching law. He is talking about their sin. You know, uh, you sin in this way and in that way, and I sin, and you sin, and the Jews sin, and the Gentiles sin, and God hates sin, and they're punishing him for sin, and this is a sin, and that's a sin, and you sin, and you're just going on and on and on, and you're, and you're reading through it, and like, okay, Paul, we get it, we can move on, but he just, he just keeps going. Um, and then this is kind of the, the end of that. After, after all of one, two, and the first half of three of this beating with the law, he says, what shall we conclude then? Are we any better? Not at all. We have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under sin. And then he starts quoting the Old Testament. He says, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. And he's just piecing together all these different passages. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness, describing our our, our natural what we are. He says, their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways. The way of peace, they do not know. And you're like, okay, Paul, enough. But he just keeps going. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now, we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, right? So when God gives the law, he's talking to the people who, who are supposed to obey it. And that, of course, is us, right? Um, and then notice the reason. So that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. I think if you would go down the street and ask people, hey, why do you think God gave the Ten Commandments? Well, I'll put it to you. What do you think, what do you think most people would say? Why did God give the Ten Commandments? Why did he give this law? Okay, so I, I do this, right? I follow this, so I, I, I get to go to heaven so that I know what God expects, you know, some, something along those lines. But notice, he doesn't say that why there's the law. He says... It says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. So the law is designed to make us be quiet, right? To, to stop talking. You know, I, I, I think of, uh, so I, I knock on a lot of doors and I try to talk to people about God and their relationship with God and all of that. And, and one of the questions that I'll often ask is, um, you know, what does it all boil down to? You know, what do you think? Are you going to go to heaven or not? Right? If you, if you die tonight, where do you think you'd end up? Seven people have answered that and said hell. Or they thought hell or probably hell. Seven out of well over 2,000. Right? So, so, and several of those told me that they had murdered someone or whatever else. You know, they, uh, you know but everybody else. So 2,436, whatever the number is, said heaven, or I think heaven, or I hope heaven, or probably heaven, or some version of that. And so then you follow it up, and, and you ask why. Um, and the people who, who said hell, well, they all pointed to some horrible thing that they had done, that they could never, you know, get to heaven. Everybody else, you know, why do you think you're going to heaven? Well, well, I'll put that with you. What do you think they're going to say? Okay. Yeah. I didn't break any of the really bad ones, right? Or, or I, I'm, a good person. I'm a pretty good person, right? I, I tried hard or, you know, I did my best and that's all God can ask for. Or, you know, something along those lines that, like, I've done all right. But notice what the law says here. It says the law is there so that every mouth will be silenced, the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in their sight by observing the law. So no matter how much of a good person I am, how many times, times I tried, even if I'm way better than someone else, and I've never done anything really bad, well, if I haven't been perfect, remember, God doesn't create on a curve. We're either holy or we're not. Um, and the law is there to say, okay, just stop trying to make your excuses, right? Because by nature, we want to say, well, I'm not that bad. I think I deserve this. The law tells us we don't, right? The, the law makes us very clear, you know, we, we we don't deserve anything good. We deserve punishment, right? Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin, he says. So, you know, the, the problem that we see with all people, well, we're all sinners. Um, some ways that we see all people are sinful, boy, it doesn't take long. You turn on the news. Uh, you watch life. You, you look in the mirror. Uh, we're, we're sinners. I put down there to clearly understand, read those verses with your name inserted. Because um, it's really easy to say, yeah, bad people are bad. No, I'm 
I'm one of those sinners. Oh. And, and that bold part is, is kind of what I talked about. Uh, uh, you know, that, well, I've been pretty good. That just doesn't apply. So the law, for, for each of these, we're going to talk about a verdict and a purpose. So the verdict of the law, gavel comes down. What's the verdict according to the law? Guilty, right? Uh, there, there's no way around it. So, so then the question, why? Why does God want us to hear that verdict? Well, uh, because we need to be real, right? Just pretending, you know, if, uh, um, I don't know, you, you, you take any court case, and if the, the person who is caught on video doing it, who has ad, ad, admitted to doing it, who, uh, you know, all of the proof is that they did it, um, and they can't go in thinking, oh, maybe I'll get away with it. Um, we have to be real. There's going to be punishment, right? It shows us our sin. We read that Romans passage. No one declared righteous in himself by observing the law, rather through the law, become conscious of sin. Uh, Vicar, you didn't get to read yet. Uh, James 2.10? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> for whoever keeps the whole law and is found in it just one point is guilty for a fall. Yeah. So we're either perfect or we're not. It shows us that, that God's serious about sin, right? The, the wrath of God being revealed. Um, and really what it does is it makes us realize we need help. That's the purpose of it. So that we see that we need help. Now, in the gospel, God's going to give us that help. But, but the purpose of the law is to make us realize we need help, make us realize we need our Savior. Um, you got the question there. Can anyone make themselves right with God on their own? No. Right? Doesn't matter what I do if I was born sinful. Um, and I sin. I, I can't fix it. So that's where God comes in. So I'm going to go and give my report to that meeting. So Victor, you can we'll take tea. I'll be the bad guy. Best guy. <laughs> you can you can give the gospel there, and, and I will be back in a few minutes. So give us some good questions. <laughs> so that was the the verdict of the law. We are guilty. Uh, now we get to the good news, the the gospel. Um, we're going to start by reading another section. I'll read this one again from Romans chapter 3. This is Paul starting to wrap up his long section of the law. Uh, so it's from that same chapter that we just heard that long law. Uh, now we hear some good news. Uh, but now a righteousness from God apart from the law has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. And so the whole purpose of the law in the first place is to point to this thing. Now, this righteousness from God it comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Uh, so righteousness, uh, basically being made right with God, it comes through faith in Jesus Christ. There is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. That word justify, it is a courtroom term. So as we hear the verdict of the law and we heard we are guilty, now we are told we are justified. This is the term that they would use in Rome if we were found not guilty. The gavel comes down uh, and we find out we don't get punished for our sins. Now, why don't we get punished for our sins? Well, by his grace, freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ. Grace is God's undeserved gift to us. It is love. And that love took on the form of redemption. Um, just because we're forgiven doesn't mean that there's no punishment for sin. There is still punishment that needs to take place. Um, but we're going to see how Jesus gets punished instead of um, we don't get punished as we deserve. Uh, God presented him as Jesus as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate justice because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. Uh, he did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time, so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Essentially, what Paul is saying, so he started with this long discourse on the law. You are guilty, you are guilty, you are guilty. You break all the commandments, even the Ten Commandments, and even the smallest commandment, uh, and that means you're, you're doomed. 
but you don't have to fix this on your own. I have come to fix them. Because of Jesus, you are declared not guilty. Sin still needs to be punished. All those wrongdoings, they still need, something needs to happen. God is just. Um, if you think of, um, let's say there was someone who came and they killed one of your family members, right? And it's the whole thing's on video. Uh, their, day, their day comes in court. Uh, the judge looks at all the evidence and they see, you know, fingerprints there, videos there, clearly did this. And the judge said, ah, it's okay. How about, yeah, you can go free. We'd be outraged. That's not justice. We understand inherently that wrongdoing still needs to be punished. Uh, but instead of us giving that punishment of death, instead of us going to hell, Jesus comes and he gives his life as a sacrifice. He is the one receiving that punishment. He made atonement for us with God. Atonement is a word with sacrifice that means basically being made at one uh, with another party. Uh, Jesus sacrificed. It was painful, um, but it's the sacrifice that we needed. Um, and it, it's the thing that people before Jesus came now looked ahead to this. That's the, uh, because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. Um, the idea that people before Jesus came, they looked ahead to Jesus. Now we look back at Jesus. Um, so Abraham still goes to heaven, even though Jesus wasn't born yet. Uh, so, so that is the verdict of the gospel. We are declared not guilty. And you see those questions there. Where can we find righteousness? Faith in Jesus. Yeah, faith in Jesus. And we learn about having faith in Jesus in the Bible and as we learn about God. Yeah. And how does God bring that righteousness to me? Yeah, yeah. He atones for our sins. He makes us right with God. And um, we get the benefits of Jesus' sacrifice by faith. Um, that was in verse 22. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe faith. It's, it's that trust that we have um, in God. Um, what is the definition of justification? Um, we are declared not guilty. Yeah, declared not guilty. Good, good old-fashioned Roman courtroom term. Um, and how does God describe justification in verse 24? What was that? By yeah, by grace through faith. Yeah, this is free, completely free, uh, and we receive redemption through Christ's blood. Taking taking take that, you want to get some of the good news as well? Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, last question on page 10. Okay. There it is. So he got you to the, the verdict. You guys talked about justification, that, that court was determined and not guilty. Um, so then... In what way does the cross show both God's justice and God's love? How would you answer that? Okay. Okay. So God didn't just say, oh, it's okay, sin is okay. Um, the way to sin is death, and he, he gave that punishment, um, the, the justice, and he has love. Yeah, you're right. It's... it's he gives us the gift of redemption. He bought us back. He uh, punished his son instead of us. Um, Romans 5.18. Kath, have you read yet? Not yet. Consequently, just as the result of one trespass was condemnation for all men, so also the result of one act of righteousness was justification that brings life for all men. For just as the Justice through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners. So also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. Okay. Um, you know, you get that for the, the result of one trespass. What, what are we talking about there? Adam's. Yeah, Adam's sin, Adam's fall. It brought condemnation for all. Uh, and the result of one act of righteousness, what act of righteousness there? Jesus dying on the cross for us, uh, that brings life for, for all. 
Um, so how many how many were declared righteous? That's a good question. What do you think? Does it mean? Okay, so so whoever it was, it was a big number, right? right. Uh, the many were made sinners. Uh, how how many were made sinners through Adam's sin? Paul, oh, right? Um, you know, he had just said justification that brings life for all men. Uh, so just like Adam's sin brought made all sinners, the what Jesus did in our place makes us righteous. And so, so we talk about the, the truth of objective justification, right? Jesus died to pay for the sins of the whole world, right? Um, objectively, it, it's a fact all sins have been paid for. Does that mean that all people are going to heaven? We'll, we'll talk about that on, on the next page a little bit. Um, so there's a difference between objective justification, it's an objective fact. But some people are going to reject that. Jesus paid their price, but some people say, no, I'd rather trust in myself than in, in you, God. And so even though their sins have been paid for, they reject that payment and, and they go their own way. But we do want to stress that what the Bible teaches is that every sin was paid for. So there's never anyone that you're going to be talking to that uh, you have to worry, well, maybe Jesus didn't pay for that one, which is nice because... You know, when I do something wrong and say, to somebody, boy, that's just too bad for God to ever forgive you, I can say, oh, no. You know, all. Uh, he paid for all sins. So the verdict of the gospel, you know, we said the verdict of the law was guilty. The verdict of the gospel, the animal comes down and him. Not guilty, acquitted, right? We're, we're, we're innocent, even though we sinned because of Jesus. He took that sin and, and gave us his perfection. So, the purpose, why? This one's a little easier, right? If the law was to show us our sins and make us realize our need, the gospel is to show us our Savior, to, to show us what Jesus did to fix the problem. Uh, John 3, 16, then. Okay. Um, it shows us God's love. You know, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. Uh, and, and even, you know, some people talk about, well, the Old Testament is the law and the New Testament is the gospel. No, not really. It's uh, both contain both. Um, and in the Old Testament, we have this beautiful picture of gospel as, as the promise of the Messiah, that's what the Messiah would do. Notice the pronouns in this, right? Surely he took up our infirmities. And carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. By his wounds, we are healed. It shows us the one who, who, who substituted for us, who, who saved us. Um, any questions on that? Then we've got two, four, six, eight passages um, to do a little practice on it. As we look at the difference between law and gospel, uh, and it's important to, to distinguish between the two because if we try to make law out of gospel or gospel out of law, we reckon both. Um, so we have to understand what God is saying and, and, and what He means. So what we'll do is is we'll read the passage and I'll ask you to identify whether that is a, a law passage or a gospel passage. So it is, does it show me my sin or does it show me my Savior? First uh, John one verse seven. Uh, you got that, Jeremy? But if we talk, but if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. All right, what do you guys think? Law or gospel? It's when you say gospel. Yeah, yeah, Jesus' blood purifies us. Yeah, absolutely. That's the good news. Uh, Kat, Matthew 548. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. That's law. Yep. Uh, do this. And I say, uh oh. Right. Uh, 1 Timothy 5 2. Right. Okay. Um, it, it's a command. It's a good thing to do, right? But it is definitely that command. Habakkuk 2 4. Jeremy? 
but the righteous will live by his faith. A, I mean, that can be taken so away. Okay, so uh, live, so I get eternal life because of faith. Uh, what's that? If you understand yes. that live. I was the same question. You mean? So if you understand the live there, the righteous will live by his faith. If you understand that to say that um, I get to live forever, I get eternal life because of faith. Um, what's that? Well, that would be yeah, absolutely, absolutely. If you're looking at it and saying, well, the righteous person is going to do the right things, well, that's, that'd be wrong. But, uh, but yeah, and in this context, he's looking at the eternal life part of it. So um, instead of dying, I get to live uh, through faith. Um, does that make sense? means the righteous person will operate his daily business according to that faith. Yeah, and so then that would be a law of action. Yep. So, but like, uh, if you, if I'm remembering the context, right, I'm thinking that this is contrasting death and life. So, um, instead of dying forever, we get to live because of faith. Then that one would be the, the gospel. But if, but if it's if the context, this is this passage actually comes up two different times in Scripture because Paul quotes it one time too in Romans. Um, but if the context is we're going to live according to what we believe, then that would be wrong, right? Because it's do this. Type right. thing. Yep. So what's your bottom line? So gospel in this gospel. passage. Yep, because it's talking about eternal life, right. um, and so that through faith we get eternal life. That's that's the gospel. Yeah. Right, exactly. Yeah, that's that's what I was saying. That if we take it just as it is, um, we could look Can't. at it. Yeah, but that, that's why it's important to look at the verses around it, right? Um, Can man limit God to just either law or gospel? <laughs> well, this is as God's communicating to us, right? And I mean, but that's a good question, right? You know, who are we to say uh, this is this is what He's saying, other than Here's how he explains himself, right? So, Romans 6, 23, uh, Kat. Is that me? Yes. Okay. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is actually law and gospel. Oh, you got the true question. Yeah, so the wages of sin is death. That part of it is law, right? Uh, but then he answers that law with the gospel. But the gift of God is eternal life. So that, that's gospel. Good. How about 57 verse 8? This one might sound a little odd, but once you um, once you do it, I'll, I'll explain why I've got that one on there. Go ahead, Matthew. Behind your doors of your dwelling place, you see how things are taken to see it. For safety. Okay, so God speaking to the Israelites about how they were turning away from him and getting into this fertility cult worship and, you know, with the uh, shrine prostitutes and stuff like that. Um, first of all, what is it, law or gospel? Yeah, he's telling them you're doing all these things wrong. Now, I put it in here because I wanted to make a point about uh, when we read the law. The temptation is always going to be, Satan is always going to want to make us try to deflect it. Right? And say, oh, not talking to me. Uh, that's those well, bad people. I'm much better than that. Now, I am guessing that you know none of us have uh, little pagan shrines in our in our homes that we you know worship. Uh, and I'm also guessing that none of us have ever been part of any fertility cult, uh, you know, temple prostitute type uh, type worship either. Uh, but if I sit here and say, oh yeah, those bad Israelites. I'm missing the point, right? God says that all of the Bible is written for us. 
to encourage us, to teach us. Um, and so how, how do you take something like this? Okay, what were they really doing? They were turning from worship of the true God uh, by, by getting involved with other things. Anytime I choose to follow something else, anytime I sin, I'm really doing the same thing. I'm, I'm turning away from the worship of the true God. So, so this law can speak to my heart just as well as it spoke to the Israelites' heart. Um, I just say, you know, if, if you ever want to get under a pastor's skin, what you do is you, you, on the way out of church, you say, hey, pastor, that was a really good sermon. So-and-so really needed to hear it. Because um, <laughs> what does that mean? That means, well, I wasn't listening for me. I was turning to someone else, right? And, and God doesn't want us to do that with his word either, right? Oh, yeah, God, you tell him. Uh, no, it's always, what are you saying to me, God? Uh, so, yeah, that one's a How about Mark 16, 16? Jerry. Sure. <clears throat> whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Bart. Okay. Whoever does not believe will be condemned. Absolutely. But that, you know, that first is pretty. Yeah. Gospel. First part is gospel. This is another one of those, you know, sometimes they're right next to each other. Uh, where he goes right from the gospel to the law. Uh, and James 4.11, Kat? <clears throat> Brothers, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against his brother or judges him speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. Law. All right. Yeah, that one's the law. With the law, God makes us unanswerable, but with the gospel, he gives us the, the answer. Any questions on that? Then you get to that, that thing of faith. You know, when I mentioned this a little bit when we were going over the verdict of the, the gospel, that, that uh, um, objective justification. The, the truths are out there, right? The law is out there that we're sinners and deserve punishment. And the gospel is out there. Jesus died to pay for all of our sins. How does it impact us? How does it interrelate to us? Well, that's where faith comes in. Um, and in lesson four, we'll talk about how we come to faith. For right now, we'll just talk about the concept of what, what faith is. Um, in Romans 4, this is Paul, again, writing to those believers in Rome and explaining how faith works. And he uses a guy that the Jews would have held up as their hero of faith. And, and their concept of him was Abraham was such a great guy. He did all the right things. He was obedient. And that's why God blessed him. And Paul says, well, you're missing it a little bit. And so um, look at how Paul uses Abraham to describe faith. He says, against all hope, Abraham in hope believed. And so became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. So uh, God made Abraham a promise. And it says, against all hope. So even though it looked like there was no reason to hope that this promise would come true, Abraham believed, um, and, and God blessed him. So verse 19, without weakening his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead. So God had promised Abraham he'd have a whole bunch of kids, a whole bunch of descendants. Um, and Abraham had gotten to be 75 years old, and he still didn't have any kids. And, and God says, you're going to have a whole bunch of descendants. Uh, and so Abraham waited, and, and uh, Abraham's 99 years old, and he still doesn't have any kids. And, and God says, you're going to have a whole bunch of descendants. Um, and, you know, Sarah was barren when she was 40 and 50 and 60. Now that she's 90, I mean, all of the facts say there's no way this is going to happen. But he said, Abraham believed, even though the facts said no way will it happen. Abraham believed because God promised it. And then, uh, verse 20, yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words it was credited to him were not written for him alone, but also for us to whom God will credit righteousness. So in other words, Abraham's blessing was not because he was righteous enough, but that righteousness was credited to him. It was put on his account. 
And he says that's the same way that, that it works for us. Um, God credits righteousness for us to believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. So Jesus died because of our sins, but then because Jesus had paid for our sins. And he hadn't sinned. Sin couldn't hold him. Death couldn't hold him anymore. And so he was proving that our sins are paid for. Uh, so he was raised to life because of our justification. Um, let's read Hebrews 11. Is that you, Matthew? Yes. Trusting something, even though, like Abraham, yes, all hope. If God promises it, I'm going to trust him. Any questions on faith? Does our belief or refusal to believe change what God is? Okay. So if if uh, um, three people have a different opinion about you, you know, uh, well, I, I think... Matthew is that you know seventy-five year old man who uh, you know whatever, and Jeremy thinks Matthew is the the teenager. Um, just because we might think that about you, is it true? No. What's true is what is true, and so. But a lot of people want to take that posture with God, right? They say, "Well, you believe that about God? Okay, that's good for you. I'll believe this about God. And that's good. Well, it can't be both if they're contradictory. We don't get to change who God is. We don't get to define who He is. He changes who we are. He defines who we are. Um, so, yeah, so, so faith is believing in what is real, it, it, is appreciating um, the facts, the reality, uh, even though I might not be able to see it. Any questions there? Through faith, God gives us a lot of blessings. And so we talk about the purposes of faith um, in these passages now, each of these talk about faith and something that we get through faith. Um, so let's take turns reading them, and I'll ask you to pick out from your from the passage uh, what gift or gifts you see there. So Romans 5.1, I don't know whose turn it is. Jeremy? Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, what gift or gifts do you see there through faith? Peace. Okay, peace. Instead of being hostile to God, we have we have peace with him. Any others? Uh, yeah. Justification is ours. Justification, yeah. That, that, that not guilty verdict. By faith, that verdict becomes ours. Uh, Romans 5.11, yeah? <clears throat> Not only is this so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Um, so we have reconciliation okay. and rejoice. Okay. So the reconciliation, we're no longer at odds. We're no, there's not a death anymore. He's reconciled that. Um, and, and we get to rejoice instead of being afraid that he's coming or that he's here. We, we get to rejoice. Romans 3.22. Yeah. Uh, okay, what gift there? The accredited righteousness. Yeah, that, uh, um, you ever get called to the principal's office in school? Um, now, there's two different ways that could go. You know, you could be going thinking, okay, what did he find out that I did? Uh, you know, which thing do I have to confess to? Um, or maybe you know that something went down, but you had nothing to do with it. Um, and, you know, that's a whole different feeling. Hey, I'm innocent to this. I'm, I'm okay going to the principal's office. And, you know, he's probably telling, you know, to give me a, a reward. But if we're coming before God and he says be perfect and we know we're not, uh, we're feeling that first way, right? But now Jesus says, no, I put my perfect righteousness, my holiness on you. So we can stand before him confident. Um, Galatians 3.26, Jeremy. He 
who are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. What's the gift through faith there? Okay, being a child of God. You know, if if uh, I wanted to go have a conversation with President Biden this afternoon, and I drove to Washington and and showed up, and I figured, you know, it would be uh, I, I could tell him the things I think he should be doing, or you know, ask him some stuff. What do you think the chances of me getting to have that conversation with President Biden would be? Zero. Probably zero, right? Um, but if my name were uh, Hunter, right, you know, or, or one of his other kids, I don't remember the other one's names, but, you know, if I'm his child and I'm living in the White House, that's a, that's a whole different thing. Um, now, we're talking about not the president, but God. And he says we have that status as his children. Ephesians 2, 8, okay? For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This not from yourselves, it is a gift of God. Um, grace. Okay, so that undeserved love that he's given us. Um, and faith. Okay, yeah, the, the ability to believe. Uh, that, that's a gift from God. Uh, Ephesians 3.12. Okay, that, that, that freedom and confidence to, to approach God, you know that. So I, I, so there was a time that I was driving my two youngest kids, and they had two things, or there were two things we were doing, and they were separate times. So I think we had like an hour to kill, and instead of going all the way home and then all the way back out, I asked them, "Hey, do you guys want to go anywhere?" And you know, and I'm thinking they're going to say, "Hey, Walmart or something like that." Uh, my son in the back seat. Hey, can we go to Disney World? <laughs> like, well, <laughs> you know, not really. We've got an hour, and we're not going to make it there, right? But, but he had no qualms, right? Of course, I can ask Dad anything, right? I mean, that's that's that that image. We get to talk to God. We get to ask Him anything. We have that freedom and confidence to talk to Him. How about Romans six fourteen? Jeremy. For sin shall not be your master, because you are not under law, but under grace. A gift there? Well, certainly grace, but then also there's a, the, um, you know, the, uh, what do you call it? I mean, freedom. Yeah. Okay. So instead, instead of having sin as our master, we have grace as our master. Um, we, so I, I had a lot of different jobs through high school and college, um, sometimes several at once, and you're just getting as many hours as possible to, to pay for school and all of that. Um, my first like real job, you know, something other than you know mowing the lawn or whatever, but my first like real punch time clock job was at a restaurant, Lynn's Family Restaurant. And, and Mary was, Mary Lynn was, was the owner and she ruled with an iron fist, right? If you were, you know, she'd be yelling at you if, if you were a minute late and you know, you better not break those dishes otherwise I'm taking out of your check. And I mean, she, she would literally scream at people. And, and uh, um, it dawned on me later that people didn't work for her for very long. I just kept doing it because oh, I figured this is how it is, right? Um, but, uh, uh, you know, if, if they had a choice, they, they, they avoided that, right? But, but then later, um, oh, and, and, and with her, you know, you didn't want to mess up, right? You wanted to do a good job so you wouldn't get in trouble. Um, but then later, I got a job at an architectural woodworking place, TJ Hale, and the owner's name was Jack Hale. And there were probably 30 of us uh, that were students at the seminary that uh, would work there in the afternoons. Um, and so we worked three hours a day and we did a lot of the packaging, shipping, that kind of stuff. But, uh, but Jack would come out and, and he, you know, walk through and he talked to us. I mean, he could have just stayed in his office and said, yeah, you guys do, do the work. You got the people telling you what to do and it'll be good. But he came out, he got to know each of us. He, um, you know, asked us how our families were. Uh, you know, one, one time uh, one of my friends was driving the brand new delivery truck 
and he went under a bridge and the clearance of the bridge and the height of the truck and he did the sardine can thing with, with the brand new first time out delivery truck. And, and Jack's uh, conversation with the guy, um, he didn't yell at him, he didn't, you know, he's like, well, I guess now you know, you just gotta make sure you check out those signs, right? Uh, for, for clearance. Um, you know, another friend was always having car trouble, but he, he never paid to get it like really fixed. He always kind of just limped it along. And, and Jack went to the mechanic and told him next time he brings it in, just fix it and I'll pay for it. And he did it. Never once did I hear him raise his voice. You know, he, uh, and yet, we wanted to do a good job for him too. Not because we were afraid he was going to yell at us, but you know, you love the guy, right? Um, so, which one would you rather be working for? Right? The law or grace, right? Um, yeah, and, and that's, you know, so many people live with the fear of God. Right, that oh, I better do this, otherwise God's going to get me. Um, God says I've removed that fear because I've paid for all of your sins, and you can live under grace. Uh, and Romans eight thirty two, cat. <clears throat> he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Okay. And, did they have to say all things? All things, yep. Um, you know, and, and notice his point. If he gave up his son for us, why do we think he's going to withhold anything, right? And I suppose all things would include lots of physical gifts that he gives to believers and unbelievers alike, right? He, he, material things and wisdom and all that kind of stuff. But all the other gifts that we just listed are all spiritual gifts, right? Peace, reconciliation, righteousness, justification, that relationship with God. Are there other ways other than through faith in Jesus that people can have those gifts? No. You know, oh, go ahead. The salvation gifts? Yeah. Absolutely. In Ephesians 2 8, we didn't really mention that. Oh, we did? Yeah, that's no, definitely one. I, 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 Yes. Good underwise. Thanks for bringing us back to that one. I, I, I must have uh, not been thinking straight. But yeah, absolutely. Uh, being saved. Instead of going to hell, we get to go to heaven. Um, yeah, and something that only happens through faith. And Hebrews 11 says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. In John 14, Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Only through Jesus. We have any of these, these gifts. So, to find those gifts in other things, but they always fall short. Um, through Jesus, we have we have those gifts in faith. Any questions on chapter two? And we'll just do the first part of chapter three. Like I said, one, two, and three are long. Four, five, and six are shorter. So we'll kind of we'll catch back up there. So um, chapter three talks about our saviors. In chapter two, we talked about sin and grace, law and gospel. Chapter 3, we're going to look at uh, who Jesus is, and that's the part we'll cover today. And then we'll also, you know, so some of his names, but then we'll also talk about uh, his active and passive obedience and his humiliation and exaltation. So, um, yeah. So, I'll start with uh, an agree or disagree question. Agree or disagree, as long as you know that Jesus existed, you go to heaven. No. Okay, exactly. Huge difference between faith and acknowledging existence. Um, Jesus was more than a historical guy that lived. He was my Savior, right? Uh, and so when we talk about believing in Jesus, we understand we're talking about more than just an intellectual assent that yes, this guy existed, and maybe he said some nice things. Um, we're talking about the one who, uh, who came as my substitute, who died for my sins. And so today we talk about what, what does it mean? What, what do we know about our Savior? Um, first of all, there's all sorts of names, right? Jesus, which means Savior. Uh, and actually, we talked about this a little bit at the end of lesson one, right? Um, the Christ... Uh, our Savior is the Christ. That's a Greek word. 
uh, Messiah or Messiah is the Hebrew word. They both mean the, the same thing, the anointed one. Um, so for the Old Testament people of Israel, um, when they saw someone being anointed with oil, they knew that they were being set apart for a specific job, right? It was like the symbol. So just like if you see someone uh, tapping someone else with, with the sword on each shoulder, you know, this guy's got a crown and he's tapping, you know what's happening, right? That guy's being knighted. For the Israelites, when they saw someone pouring a horn of oil over someone's head, um, they knew that this person was being set apart for a specific job. And, you know, so the, the priests, the high priest would be anointed set apart for that job. The king would be anointed. The, the prophets would be anointed. You know, in other words, listen to, to these guys, right? Um, and throughout the Old Testament, God promised the one who was anointed to be our Savior. Uh, and so talking about the Messiah and all these different uh, descriptions got added uh, as, as the, the prophecies went down, right? That he'd be born in Bethlehem, that he'd be born of a virgin, that he would uh, die on a cross, that he would be pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our, you know, all of these things about the Messiah. So the Israelites are looking forward to this Messiah. And then Jesus comes and says, yeah, that's me. Now, saying that, if it wasn't, brought the death penalty. But, but Jesus said it. And, and more than that, right? First of all, he was anointed by God. Uh, we looked at Jesus' baptism, right? When the Holy Spirit descended on him like the dove. And, and John would later write about that and say, I wouldn't have known who he was, but, but God told me that the one I see the Spirit descend on, that, that's the one, that's the Messiah. So he, he was anointed by God in a special way. Uh, he called himself the Messiah. Right, a couple passages there in, in John 4, the, the lady says, oh, the Messiah, you know, let, let's not worry about this. The Messiah will explain it all. Who can really know? Jesus says, I am the Messiah. I can speak to him. Uh, in Luke 24, Jesus talked about uh, how God's word was all talking about him. You know, that everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of those prophets and the Psalms. And then Jesus perfectly fulfilled all those Old Testament prophecies, even the ones that were impossible, like being born of a virgin. But but he also was born in Bethlehem. He, he was taken out of, you know, grew up in Nazareth. He, he was rescued from Egypt. You know, all of these things, all of those prophecies, Jesus fulfilled them. Um, let's read Acts 4, 12. I forget who read it last. I think Kat did, so Matthew, I'm going to take it. So they So the, the only way, um, yeah, and so Jesus is that Messiah, and that was promised. Uh, Jesus is true God. Uh, the Bible describes him as true God by his divine names, his divine attributes, and his divine works. So, so we start with the names, kind of scan through those. Uh, 1 John 5, we know that the Son of God has come, uh, and, and even Jesus Christ, he is the true God. And eternal life. Colossians 2, and in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. He's completely true God. Uh, John 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. Uh, and then he says that Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So, of course, talking about Jesus. 1 Corinthians 2, 8, it's called him the Lord of glory. So, so he's given divine names, um, he's got divine attributes. Um, so in lesson one, we looked at some of the attributes of God. Uh, those same things are ascribed to Jesus, right? He's unchangeable. Uh, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. He's omnipresent, right? Surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. He's omniscient. Peter says, you know all things. He's omnipotent. Um, you know, all powerful. All powerful. He's going to do his name. Um, so those attributes are things that only can be said of God and, and they're said of Jesus. Uh, and then his divine deeds. So Jesus, the Son of God, was involved in creation, right? Three and all things were made. Well, I'm not going to play that for me. Um, he showed his divinity in his miracles. And I didn't put any down there because I figured you could probably make a list longer than I would want to type out. So what miracles? Just let's shoot out five of them. Uh, five miracles that Jesus did. Jesus water into wine. Turning water into wine. 
doing the leverage. Yep. What's that? Walking on water. Yeah. Um, I mean, think of all of those healings the, the leper, the paralyzed, the blind, the mute, the dumb, the dead, uh, raising them. So, so, yeah, all those miracles, what do they tell us? They tell us that he's acting with the power of God, he, he is true God. And number three, the forgiveness of sins. Um, this is that story of uh, when, I won't read the whole thing, but uh, when Jesus was teaching in a house in Capernaum and it was full because everybody wanted to hear him. And some guys had a friend that was paralyzed. They wanted to get into Jesus so Jesus could heal him. They couldn't get into the house, so they walked, they climbed up on the roof, removed some of the slats, lowered the guy down. And, and Jesus says, He looked at him and he says, Son, your sins are forgiven. And, and hearing that one in Sunday school, I was always like, Come on, Jesus, you, you know he wants to be healed. What are you doing wasting his time here? But, but Jesus knew it was most important. Uh, and, and so he, he dealt with that spiritual thing first. He said, Your sins are forgiven. And then uh, it says that the, some of the teachers of the law that were there were uh, upset with Jesus, saying, Who does this guy think he is? Right? Only God can do that. And, and uh, um, then Jesus, knowing what they were thinking, says, Okay, which is easier? To, to say your sins are forgiven or to say, you know, be healed. Uh, and, and so then he says, just so you know, I've got the power to forgive sins. Get up, take your mat, and walk, and the guy does. So he, he said that by doing that, he was demonstrating his, his power. Um, so yeah, uh, his divine deeds, uh, even the forgiveness of sins. Any questions there? So Jesus, true God, because... Um, well, he fulfilled all the prophecies. Uh, he's called God. He's got the divine attributes, and he has the divine deeds. Any questions there? Then I think that is where we will cut it, uh, because the next part will probably take a, a few minutes more than two. So uh, um, let me make a note there that. Uh, And let's close with prayer. Lord God, thank you for this time in your word. Bless us through it that we grow in our appreciation for who you are and what that means for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Thank you, Pastor. Both of the others, well, a couple of texts back there. there. Saw him, never saw him do that. So, and you guys have a fantastic week.